In 1969, English rock band Spooky Tooth would release a song called Better By You, Better Than Me. The song would appear on Judas Priest's 1978 album Stained Class. And seven years later, on December 23rd, 1985, two young men, an 18-year-old named Raymond Belknap and a 20-year-old named James Vance, who both hailed from Sparks, Nevada, spent the night drinking and smoking pot and listening to a Judas Priest record before making a pact to take their own lives. The pair of men went to a nearby playground at a church and attempted to end their lives with a shotgun. Belknap would die instantly while Vance would survive, albeit being horribly disfigured, and live for another three years before finally passing away. The LA Times reported his passing in 1988, claiming he was admitted to a hospital for depression before slipping into a coma and passing away. The paper claimed that a drug overdose may have resulted in him lapsing into a coma, and it was revealed that Vance left behind a one-year-old daughter. The families of the victims soon turned their anger towards Judas Priest and their label CBS Records. They blamed both parties for their son's deaths, alleging the band hid subliminal messages on their cover of Better By You, Better Than Me, which could be found if the track was played backwards, they'd allege. Amongst these subliminal messages they alleged to be included on the recording were, and I quote, do it and let's be dead. The lawsuit was spurred after lone survivor James Vance wrote a letter to Belknap's mother, which read, and I quote, I believe that alcohol and heavy metal music such as Judas Priest led us to being mesmerized. A civil lawsuit would be filed in 1986, one year after the incident, but wouldn't go to trial until 1990 in the Paris home state of Nevada. The family sought a minimum of $3.6 million in damages to cover medical bills and support for Vance's daughter. It was two years prior that Ozzy Osbourne had been involved in a similar case, over the lyrics to one of his songs, which allegedly drove a fan to take his own life. But unlike the Osborne lawsuit, which was thrown out of court because Ozzy's lyrics were protected under free speech, the same couldn't be said for Judas Priest. Technically, subliminal messages aren't considered speech. The case involving Judas Priest became more about whether there were subliminal messages and whether they were discernible to the average listener and whether they could influence someone's thinking. It may surprise you to know that the complainants originally took the band to court over another song called Hero's End from the same album. Jane Andrews, who served as a member of the band's management team, would reveal that the complainants took issue with the lyrics on the song. With Andrews recalling, they tried to say the band were saying you could only be a hero if you killed yourself, till I had to give them the correct lyrics, which is why do heroes have to die. Then they changed their plea to subliminal messages on the album, they would say. Guitarist Glenn Tipton would tell Louder Sound, it's a fact that if you play speech backwards, some of it will seem to make sense. So I asked permission to go into the studio and find some perfectly innocent phonetic flukes. The lawyers didn't want to do it, but I insisted. We bought a copy of the Stained Class album in a local record shop, went into the studio, recorded it to tape, turned it over and played it backwards. Right away we found, hey mom, my chair's broken and give me a peppermint and help me keep a job. The lawyers for Judas Priest and their label contended that the band had no known subliminal messages on the record and instead questioned the character of the two young men, pointing to their troubled upbringing as being responsible for their deaths. The LA Times even wrote a profile during the trial on the mothers as well as their sons and it was less than flattering. The article would state that Belknap's mother had been previously married four times and that her son was a subject of abuse from her fourth husband going on to write and I quote, Belknap showed no interest in school and, like Vance, dropped out of the 10th grade. Working a series of construction jobs, he acquired a sawed-off shotgun, a 22 rifle, and a dart gun. He drank alcohol, smoked marijuana, and, according to James Vance, experimented with amphetamines and cocaine. Still, his mother insists that Belknap was not a drug abuser, saying, He paid room and board, helped around the house, and always took part in family activities such as fishing, swimming, and backpacking. Court records also show that Belknap stole $450 from his employer in 1984 and took a bus to Oklahoma to visit his natural father. He gave himself up to the police and was placed on probation. Looking back on the events leading up to her son's death, Robertson says she thinks Belknap had one glaring fault. When it came to making decisions, Ray did not know how to take the lead. He was always a follower. As for Vance, the LA Times would write, According to court documents, Vance's biological father abandoned his 17-year-old mother while she was still pregnant with his boy. Vance was held back to repeat the first and second grades. At the age of seven, he was sent to a therapist for tying a belt around his forehead and ripping out handfuls of his own hair during class. The paper would go on to write about a domestic altercation between Vance and his mother, with his mother telling the paper, My biggest problem with the school system was that they would say James's behavioral problems came from home. No one would acknowledge that he had a learning disability until the sixth grade. 
Court documents also reveal that Vance's stepfather was, and I quote, a weekend alcoholic, and his mother also drank in excess prior to stopping in the early 70s. The Times would cite the same court documents that reported a history of drug abuse with Vance attending AA and NA meetings and running away from home upwards of 13 times. Despite all this, Vance blamed music for her son's problems telling the paper. Heavy metal changed his personality. When James started listening to Judas Priest, he lost all respect for authority, she'd say. The complainants had several star witnesses, one of which was author Wilson Brian Key, who had written extensively about subliminal messages. The defense's other star witness claimed to be an audio expert, but it turned out he was actually a marine biologist who dabbled a bit in audio. Here's the news media highlighting these two witnesses. James and Ray were chanting, do it, do it, do it. They did not even know where it came from. Do it. it came from the Judas Priest album, according to Dr. Wilson Brian Key, a professor of marketing who has written extensively on subliminal messages. He says the song, Better By You, Better Than Me, contains the barely audible words, do it, repeated over and over. And each time do it is it increased in hysterical intensity. So it's do it, do it, do it, do it. And we pulled 12 of those out of that one song. Dr. Keaton sees images of sex and death in all kinds of things, from the Ritz cracker to 17th century art. He sees the word sex written in Lincoln's beard on the $5 bill. There is no subliminal content on the stained glass album. Observers of the music scene are frightened by this and other recent court cases. I think right now the attacks on rap music and heavy metal represent a very essential threat to liberties. The members of the Judas Priest band say they've done nothing wrong, that the whole notion of subliminal lyrics is preposterous. But you say do it sometime during the recording. No. George Their main witnesses is Wilson Brian Key, who's written books on subliminal messages. Time must end before 16. This reoccurs in the lyrics. The idea that 16 is a high point in life. After that, it's all downhill, so pick your time and place and blow yourself away. Okay, the first line of Red Forward uh, says, New arms into adular bliss. Now, when you take that line out and play it backwards, you're getting this. Sing my evil spirit. Attempt to demonstrate the existence of these alleged subliminal messages, the prosecution recently brought in a man named Bill Nikloff, who was identified as an audio expert, but who turned out to be a marine biologist and only an amateur audio enthusiast. Nikloff set up some computerized equipment and proceeded to unveil what he seemed to think were such evil hidden messages as do it and F the Lord. See what you make of this. And would you... Miss, would you tell us what of your uh, reverse phrases we are hearing now? Um, at, expletive for uh, the Lord. I think that because of the, uh, what we're hearing today with regards to, to the real credibility of the witness, the, this, the whole case is based on, on this so-called expert's testimony. And it appears to be more and more shallow. You know, this guy's no qualifications. And, uh, you know, it, it just doesn't seem to be... Uh, they, don't, they just don't seem, to be, don't seem to be able to prove in any way, shape, or form whatsoever that there are these subliminal messages on the album. Judas Priest frontman Rob Halford would look back at the courtroom proceedings saying, we had to sit in this courtroom in Reno for six weeks. It was like Disney World. We had no idea what a subliminal message was. It was just a combination of some weird guitar sounds and the way I exhaled between lyrics. I had to sing better by you, better than me in court, a cappella. I think that was when the judge thought, what am I doing here? No band goes out of its way to kill its fans, he frustratingly added. The LA Times would report that one of the days of the trial would see the case moved from the courtroom to the recording studio reporting and I quote, Nevada District Judge Jerry Whitehead will convene his court in a Reno studio to listen to recordings of the original 24 tracks that were mixed into Better By You, Better Than Me on the album Stay in Class. Lawyers for the British group and CBS Records say they will also present testimony from the album's sound engineer and producer that there were no phrases such as do it hidden in the song. Even Rob Halford would take the stand and be asked to sing parts of the song and claim that the phrase do it may have been mistaken by the complainant's lawyers as him inhaling. Are there subliminal do it on the Better By You, Better Than Me song? Absolutely not. This past Tuesday in Reno, Nevada District Court, Rob Halford repeatedly denied the previous week's findings of a so-called audio expert who searched long and hard for backwards messages in the music of Judas Priest. What are the sounds that you hear at those locations? 
uh, on the 24 track uh, made up of. The sounds I hear are essentially um, my own exhalation of breath at the end of the at the end of the line that I'm singing. And to show that he didn't invent a way to sing forward in order to be understood backward, Halford even gave an impromptu performance. Would you sing those two lines with the, as you sang them? Can we just sing them now? Yes. Can you sing them? You need a drink of water first? I think I get the right key. Um, it goes, <clears throat> Better than you, better than me. You can say what I can see. Thank you. If the yeah, is the exhalation of breath? Yes. Uh, is that a normal part of your singing? That's the way I've always sung this. It's mine. Halford would recall to the louder sound, it tore us up emotionally hearing someone say to the judge and the cameras that this is a band that creates music that kills young people. We accept that some people don't like heavy metal, but we can't let them convince us that it's negative and destructive. Heavy metal is a friend and gives people great pleasure and enjoyment and helps them through hard times, he would say. In the end, the band wouldn't be found liable for the fans' deaths, but as MTV would report here, the ruling didn't make anyone happy. In a 108-page written decision handed out to the only parties on hand in court to receive it, the plaintiffs and their attorneys, Judge Jerry Carr Whitehead found that Judas Priest and CBS Records are not liable in causing the deaths of James Vance and Raymond Belknap. The words do it are present several times on the Stained Class album and are subliminal, but they are the result of a chance combination of sounds and are not intentional. There is no proof of backwards masking on the album, and in any case, no scientific proof that backwards masking can be perceived or affect conduct. The judge also ruled that corporate attorneys for CBS were inexcusably slow in providing master tapes of the Judas Priest album, and that had those tapes been provided promptly, the whole trial might have been avoided. In light of this, he fined CBS $40,000 to be paid to plaintiff's attorneys to compensate for costly court delays. While Judge Whitehead ruled that the band and its record company have prevailed on the ultimate issues in this case, he also noted that scientific research into the effect of subliminal messages is in its infancy and that this subject is simply not a closed issue. I think it means they've got to watch out. This certainly isn't going to be the last case like this. And uh, I would certainly file another one tomorrow morning. Sooner or later, a case like this will win. It's just a matter of time. It's always tough when you're doing a new thing. And it's difficult on the judge. It's difficult on the system. But this case will not be new five years from now. It will be the equivalent of uh, cigarettes causing cancer. Five years from now, we'll all know this music causes violence and, and death among adolescents. Judas Priest guitarist Glenn Tipton worried that this sort of attitude could have a chilling effect on the arts. And if, if before you actually create something artistically, be it uh, through any media, you know, through books, magazines, uh, songs, or whatever, if it crosses your mind that you should be very careful what you put down in case you get a lawsuit. Aren't we all being, isn't Big Brother watching this? Aren't we all being closed down? It would come out during the trial that Judas Priest did admit to using subliminal message once. Halford would testify during the trial that he intentionally placed a hidden message in the song Love Bites, which was recorded about seven years after Stained Class. Halford said he hoped that the message, which can be understood only when the record is played backwards, would enhance its value. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe, and we'll see you again in Rock and Ultra Stories. Take care.